Sheila had called me earlier in the week and asked if she could open and, and uh, having the forgetfulness that I have, I said, well, yeah, I'll just call Tim and uh, forgetting that Tim was going to be out of town anyway, so, but anyway, um, I had no idea what, what her intentions were, but I got to tell you, I swear before God, I'm sitting here listening to this. And knowing what I know, having talked to Doke and his wife and Don and Jane, I thought she had to have talked to him. I mean, it, Sheila, I'm telling you, it was the Holy Ghost. So, And there's nothing more powerful than that. And that tells me in and of itself that something has already taken place. Now, we may look for manifestation. You know, we may look for certain things to show up or to be revealed to us. But I'm telling you, if God knew this well enough to place that on your heart, and God knew what he was going to do by the Spirit already. So I'm, I'm all on board for that, praise God. So we're, going to do th we're doing things a little bit differently. Instead of having worship right now, we're going to do that at the end. And then we'll have a chance to have prayer again. Because I'd, like I'd like to pray for Doak again. Not because I don't believe it's already done, but just affirmation. And likewise for these young people that are facing the things that they face. All, all of our children and grandchildren, they're, they're living in a tough time. It's a, it's a weird world. And, uh, but we have to take authority, and that's what we're going to do. But because of the things that were said this morning that went along uh, with what I wanted to speak to you about, I just felt like maybe the best transition would be just to go right to the Word of God now. Then we'll have worship and, and have a chance for prayer again at the end of the service. So, but I, ca I, I can't uh, go forward without uh, sharing some powerful things here first. And that is that I used to make the best donuts ever. I really did. I was a great donut maker. But I lost half the recipe, so now I just make the holes. <laughs> My younger brother wanted to be an only child. Somebody said to me this morning, "Why are those throwback clothes? And I said, every... All the clothes I own are throwback clothes. That's all I have in my closet. <laughs> and last, and for your benefit, the last, I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So God is good. Amen. And uh, we want to go right to the Word of God. So uh, Suzanne, if you will... Uh, I want to start in Genesis, which is a good place since that's the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 28. And I hope you can uh, connect with me here this morning because what I'm feeling in my spirit, what, what Sheila shared with us and, and things that, uh, that we had talked about earlier, I believe are in tune with what what I have to say here this morning as well. Maybe not precisely, but certainly in the context of how God revealed it to me. So, and I'll just start out by saying, I, I, this was part of my notes, but I, but I redid it, and Sally can tell you, Thursday, I think it was, or Friday, I just changed the entire message. And I had a message, and I don't like doing that because if I already have it, I feel like I'm, I can relax now until Sunday, you know what I mean? But that didn't work, so I had to change everything. And part of what I was going to share was that the sins of the fathers, the scripture talks about the sins of the fathers being passed to the children for generations upon generations. We even know that there are some that have written books about this that uh, claim that we have generational curses and so on and so forth. That's bogus. It's just not true unless you're not saved because it says that the sins of the fathers are passed on to the children up to the sixth and seventh generation to them who love not God. But if you have a relationship with God, then those, those things are stopped. Amen. The fathers, it says the fathers have drank 
sour wine or bitter grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So in other words, the fathers have a problem under the old covenant, and it's passed on to the children. The children suffer the consequences of the father's issues. That's old covenant. But under the new covenant, the parent's behavior is not visited on the children. Amen. Jesus, if you remember at the cross, he's hanging on the cross, and the soldiers brought him a cup filled with bitter wine, sour grape wine, sour juice, you know. And they dipped a sponge in it and stuck it to his mouth. And if you go back to the scriptures, that is the moment when Jesus said, it is finished. He took the sour grapes. He took the, the bitterness of the curse that was being passed down from generation to generation, and he took it all himself. So that the sins of the fathers are no longer passed on to the children. They all came to Jesus, and he suffered that sour wine, that bitterness. His teeth were put on edge so that yours don't have to be. So, with that being said, Genesis 128, God blessed them, and God said unto them, this is Adam and Eve. This is the beginning. This is how it all started. This was God's plan, right? He blessed them. He said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God said that you are to have dominion. You're to be fruitful. You're to be healthy. You're to be blessed. Amen? Chapter 2, verse 1, Peter. And he says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and the host of them. Well, God's saying the same thing Jesus said, it's finished, it's done, it's all good, it's all over, amen, it's taken care of. All right, now look at Matthew, if you will, 16, verses 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The, rock, the foundation that he's going to build this church on is a revelation of Jesus, of God in the flesh. So he says, I say that thou art the rock, Peter, and the, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you buy, shall bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's talking about dominion again, right? Verse 28. And this is what's interesting to me. He tells these people, And I say unto you, there are some of you standing here which will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Praise the Lord. We're always putting this off into the future. Jesus, and there will be a second coming of Jesus. I'm not denying that. But there is, a, there is a revelation of Jesus. There is a revealing of Jesus right now, here, today, and every day. As long as there are people here that are believers in God. That's the intention of God. Every time we have a healing, every time we have a, a, a deliverance, every time that happens, it's a revealing of Jesus. It's a revelation of God. It's His uh, appearing, if you will. Amen. Now, we've been given the same dominion, amen, the same mandate as Adam, and that is to subdue and, and take dominion, amen, of this natural realm. Amen? amen? God hasn't changed His mind. It may have been 6,000 years ago, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever His original intent was, it still is. Yes. Amen? God still wants to fill the earth with Heaven's government, with Heaven's influence, and with Heaven's resources. I'm not saying that we see all this around us. I'm not saying that everything that we see is all that there is. I'm saying Jesus handed us a finished work with ongoing effects. The work is finished. The question of the ongoing effects is now up to us. We are the ones that have dominion. Praise the Lord. That's why I, I so respect Doke. Why? Because Doke is doing what God said. Amen? And I'm not telling people, I'm, I don't tell people, don't go to the doctor, don't do this. You know that. I, I, I'm not that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, you may not see it, but you have a finished work. Amen? It's an ongoing work. Somebody has to believe it for it to be seen. Praise the Lord. So, uh, it's, it's an ongoing work. It's...
with ongoing effect. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11. And I'll try to talk fast so we can go. Praise the Lord. If the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious or more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, which was the old covenant, much more does the ministration of righteousness, the new covenant, exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Or in other words, he's saying, if, if it looks like uh, that old covenant had some glory, the new covenant has so much more glory that it makes it look like there was no glory with the old covenant. It's that extreme. It's that different. So if the minister, for if that which is done away was glorious, that's the old covenant, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Praise the Lord. We are not under the old covenant. And we don't want to mix the two covenants. That's where guilt and condemnation and shame, that's where it comes from. If you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling shame, if you're feeling condemnation, you're, you're living your life in the wrong covenant. You're living your life under the law. The law was fulfilled by Jesus. He took the bitterness. He took the, 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 the cost of failure to keep that law so that we could live free of that law. So that we could live without condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And he's not talking about walking after the flesh being bad behavior. He's talking about operating from a natural intellect rather than from the word of God. Yes. Amen. So the old covenant was given to an old man. Amen. The old covenant was given to people who did not have Christ. They were part of the... the uh, experience of Adam's fall. Adam had dominion. Adam had it all. Adam was innocent. But when he fell, there came the knowledge of good and evil. So there ha it had to be dealt with. So the law comes. Amen. And the law came to the old man, to the fallen man, to help the old man, to help Adam, amen, deal with this awareness, this knowledge of good and evil. Amen. So the, the law came the old covenant came to the old man to try to make him do right. To do the right stuff. To behave in the right way. But the new covenant was given to the new man. To the person that's born again. To show them their righteousness. So if you're getting information, wherever it's coming from, that says you're unrighteous, that you're, that you're less, that you're, that you're lacking. I don't care where you're from, what your ethnicity, what your, you know, your background. None of that matters to God. It's only stuff that we deal with here in the natural realm. To God, we're either children of God or we're, or we're lost. Period. Amen? So look at Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can say it like this. It's a choice to believe in faith knowledge over sense knowledge. Yes. Amen. That's your choice. That's what he's talking about here. You get to choose. Choose faith knowledge or choose sense knowledge. You're going to be stuck with the consequences. Amen? Because you've got dominion. Whether you understand it or not, whether you realize it or not, you have dominion. And so what you choose is what you get. Gen Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. God says, let there be light. Right? Yes. And there was light. And he goes on. He says, let this and let that and let the other. And whatever it was he said, it became. Now listen to me. Sound came before sight. There was nothing here. It was void. It was nothing. Till God spoke. Sound comes first. And then sight. Sight changes because of sound. The right sound will change what you're seeing. Amen. It was dark. Void. Darkness upon the face of the earth. And God said, he didn't say, wow, it's really dark. He said, let there be light. 
And the, the result of that sound was sight. It changed, all right? Sound is the building block of all matter. In fact, I've taught on this, and it's not unique to me, but, you know, they've, from the time Don, you and I, Doke, some of us, Sheila maybe, I don't, I'm not trying to put you in my age group, but, uh, you know, we had the atom, and the atom had the nucleus, you know, and the protons and the neutrons and so forth. Well, since then, since the 50s and, and 60s, they found that there are even smaller particles that are called quarks, and then within those quarks they find sound waves. They, the bottom line, and we know everything is made of atoms, right? So the building blocks of, of all matter is sound. In other words, you get it down to its smallest denomination or denominator, and it's sound. Yes. Sound is what makes everything exist. Now, you say, well, that, that, I don't get that. You don't have to understand it. It's just a fact. It's a scientific fact. This isn't just some religious mumbo-jumbo, right? So look at this. Your words yes. build your life. Yes. Yes. Now, look, Matthew, and Jesus is telling us this yes. 2,000 years ago. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. I say unto you, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you say is what you're going to get. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God said, I sent my word, and it comes down like rain, and it will do what it's sent to do. If it comes back to me, it will not come back to me void. How does it come? It came to us from the voice of God, and it was written down. It was written down so that we could read it and then say it back to God. Not just so that we could read it like a history book somewhere and just make you know, information out of it. No, it's given to us so we know what to say so that we can get what God wants us to have. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your words will change your world. What you say will change your environment. This is exactly what Sheila's talking about. I am. I, I love that. Why? Why? Because the I am is connecting us with, like Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He's making the connection with us and God. So I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am accepted in the beloved. I am perfect in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And so are you, if you believe it. And if you believe it, you need to be saying it. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are not just words. They're spirit and they're life. They're alive. They, have, they bring life. They, they, they change things. And he said, goes on to say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what we are to live by. Not by Fox News or CNN or anybody else or, or some politician. My Lord, I, I'm so sick of these. Every time a politician comes on, I just say, liar! <laughs> you liar! I mean, I get, I get so frustrated. And I don't care who they are. They're all lying. Now, I have my preference in terms of what they're lying about. You know what I mean? But, but it's, all, it's all about their agenda. I've lived long enough to know. I've, I've, I've voted in enough elections, amen, to know that most of the time, they're just going to do what they want to do anyway. They just want to get elected. So they'll tell you whatever you want to hear. So you'll vote for them. And then when they get in there, it's all about their agenda. That just aside. Praise the Lord. Can't help myself. I'm sick of elections. And I, I like to think, okay, finally, November will come and that'll be the end. Of, no, it won't. It'll just be the beginning of the next four-year election. Praise the Lord. So let me show you something that, that God showed me. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Now, we know that by his stripes we were healed. We know that he became poor that we might become rich. We knew that he, that he suffered all of these relational dysfunctions so that we, our relationships could be restored. We know that he, uh, he was uh, rejected and, and refused so that we can understand our acceptance in God. So that we can understand that we are accepted. That we are not trying to prove ourselves to be acceptable. We've already been declared accepted. So blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now, 
the book of Revelation is just simply a, a condensed version of the entire Bible. And I've talked about this a lot of times. We have a tendency to read it and see all these spooky, weird stuff going on. But the truth is it's all symbols, parables, all of the same things that we're seeing throughout the entire Bible. But then when we get to the book of Revelation, we want to make it all literal. And that's why it looks so crazy. These flying bugs and, you know, all this other weird stuff. It's just, it's just a continuation of the Bible. If you understand the Bible, you'll understand Revelation. The problem is we don't generally understand the Bible well enough so that when we get to the book of Revelation, we don't have a clue what he's talking about. But anyhow, here's the book of Revelation. He says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that keep, hear the words of this prophecy. This is all prophecy. It's all prophetic. It's all from the word, mouth of God. Amen. So the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein. Or believe them and live off of those things. For the time is at hand. Now that word. This is what's fascinating. The, the word translated hand here. Is number 1451 in your strongest concordance. You can look it up for yourself. It's a Greek word which is egus. E-G-G-U-S. And that means to squeeze or to throttle. Now, I love word studies. In fact, that's where most of my messages come from. They just come from word studies. You just start finding these things all through the Bible and they connect together. And so the Spirit is telling us if we understand revelation words, the throttle is in our hands. Praise the Lord. The reading and understanding of God's vision... These words are empowering. He gives us dominion. You will have authority, right? They're empowering, praise the Lord. And revelation enables you to speed certain things up. It's a finished work, but it's an ongoing result. Amen? See, he said, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom before you die. Before you, some of you, before you pass away, you'll see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. He's saying, you can speed the process up. You don't have to wait, you know, for 2,000 years. You don't have to wait for some time way out in the future. If you understand the revelation, you can speed the process up. You can experience healing today. You don't have to wait for heaven. You understand what I'm saying? You can have prosperity now. You don't have to wait to get the streets of gold. You can have all your needs met right here. Amen. You don't have to be rejected and, and, and uh, put aside and condemned. You can have favor and acceptance and love and, and relationship right here and now in this world. See, the reading and the understanding of God's vision will speed things up. To the degree that you have faith is the degree to which you see the revelation unfold. You control when it happens. How many of you know, you, you, we've known about these things for years and years and years. But at some point, we really needed it. So we started exercising faith in it. What happened? Jesus shows up. You got a healing. You got deliverance. You got, it was there all along. But you had to get the throttle. You had to understand this truth and believe in this truth in order to bring it into the existence that you're experiencing at the moment, at that particular time. You can hasten the day of the Lord in your life or you can delay it. Praise the Lord. I know people don't like that because we don't want to take responsibility. But that's what he gave us. When he gave us dominion, he gave us responsibility. Yes. John said these things must shortly come to pass. And then he says the time is at hand. Matthew 16, 28. We read it in the opening. Jesus said some of you will not pass before you see the kingdom of God. And the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a, it isn't a question of whether it's coming. It's a question of whether we're going to see it. In Revelation 1.10, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now that's more than chronology. We're not talking just about you know, chronological events or days and months and years and so on and so forth. It's Jesus Christ Himself is the day of the Lord. He is our Sabbath. Is He not? Yes. He is the day of the Lord. So when the finished work of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is revealed, you're beholding the day of the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Once you behold it, you can enter into this day. Yes. This day declares you are no longer in Adam. You are in Christ. 
You can spend 40 days in the wilderness or you can spend 40 years in the wilderness. It's a question of faith. Praise the Lord. And it's true for us today. We can experience the promises of God today or we can live our entire life without it and wait till we die and go to heaven and get the benefits there. But God never intended for us to have to die to get the benefits. He died so that we could have the benefits here and now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. And young people, I hope, and I know, you know, you, your attention span is like mine most of the time. And that's okay. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying, if you get anything out of what I'm saying today, get this. God loves you. God has a perfect plan for your life. God is not discouraged. God is not confused. God is not uh, disappointed. God knows you, and He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a good end plan for you, and it will come to pass. The only question is, will you believe it? Or how long will it take for you to believe it? I was 30 years old before I could really believe it. He had it from day one. It was mine from the moment I came into this world. But I didn't know it. It took me 30 years of floundering around and drugs and screwed up relationships and dysfunction and self-hatred and all of these other things before I came to the realization that God did love me and He loved me just because He's God, not because of what I was doing or not doing. And it's true for everybody. So He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's God. It's not you. Amen? God's intention is to be manifest in human flesh. Not just in Jesus. Jesus is just our older brother. He's just the firstborn of many brethren. He wants it in all of us. That doesn't mean we're going to walk around like Jesus perfectly without sin. No, He did that so that we can be who we are naturally and still have the benefits of being perfect. He... He became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Not by my effort, by my works, but by what He had done, His finished work. Jesus Christ came as the patterned son, or the, or the prototype. And the reason He did it was to show us what was the heart of God for His creation. Matthew, look at, let's go back to Matthew again for a moment. 16, Matthew 16, verses 12. how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Jesus is talking about, you know, uh, get the bread and so on and so forth. And they're thinking he's talking about lunch, and he's actually talking about the leaven or the, the mixture of law and grace. If you mix them, you get nothing. You don't get the benefit of either one. So that's what he's talking about. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, say, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So they didn't, they didn't see who he was. They didn't get the picture, right? They didn't understand. All right, Genesis 1.28 tells us you don't have to go there. I'll just read it. God said he blessed them. He gave them uh, blessings. He made them to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the flesh and the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves. So he gave them dominion, Right? All right, so he gives them dominion. This is the heart of God. And now God shows up, and he says, who, who do people think I am? And they say, well, they think you're a religious teacher, or you're some prophet, or you're, you're this, or the, you're that, or the other thing. All right, look at John now, chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, and I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. 
He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. This is a picture of humanity. Amen. Born blind. Without God, without a connection, without an understanding. So the, here's the problem, though. Sometimes we're not only born in our physical birth blind, but even in our new birth. Because the scripture tells us whenever the law is preached, there is a veil over their eyes. Whenever we preach judgment and condemnation and guilt and you're not good enough or you're something less, then we're putting, a, we're putting a blindfold on people so that they cannot see God. They don't recognize God. They're just hearing a prophet, a, a preacher, a, some judgmental kind of stuff. And they're not seeing God. They're not seeing the reality of who God is. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we sat in religious systems. We're, we're blinded to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. John said it, we, we're here and all we do, you know, in many church services and organizations that I've been a part of, is just people come in and all we do is point out their sin to them all, all through the service. Well, this is why you've got the problem, because you're not good, you're not being good enough, you're not like Jesus, you're not perfect. Of course you're not, you're a human being. If you were like Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die, you would have just been perfect. Praise the Lord. His disciples ask him, who sinned? I mean, what else would they ask? They are under the law. When Jesus is here on the earth, it, they're still under the law. And they're saying somebody had to sin because look at the consequences. There's bad stuff happening here. This, this person's blind. There must have been sin somewhere. Right? When you don't see the finished work of Jesus, you're always on a sin hunt. You're always looking for a reason why this didn't happen for me. Why this hasn't taken place. Why? Well, because I know I had that extra beer. Or I, you know, cussed that guy out. Or, or, you know, my truck didn't start the other day. So I had to take a cab. I hope the cops don't find it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That kind of stuff where we just do stupid things. And then we, that's the excuse. That's the reason why I didn't get healed. That's the reason why I feel so bad about myself. And that's why, you know, that's what happens, praise the Lord. Always looking for somebody to blame for the problem. Well, if I can't find anybody else, that's why there's so much bitterness in churches and so on and so forth. Because after a while, I get tired of blaming myself. Or I don't want to be responsible, so I'll find somebody else. It must be their fault. They're talking about me. They're praying against me. They're not in agreement. You know, all the kind of craziness that we've all experienced at some time or another. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, and I'll show you. This is in the very beginning. What happens? Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, Adam and Eve did what? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, they were innocent. They didn't know there was good, and they didn't know there was evil. They were just like little kids, innocent. God never judged them based on their behavior because they were innocent. There wasn't any law. So he tells them, do not eat from that tree because the moment you do, you're going to die. In other words, spiritually, you're going to get disconnected from me because now you're going to have guilt. You're going to have shame. And they did immediately. And they try to cover themselves and all this stuff. God comes and says, who told you you were naked? He said, who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat, that you should not eat of? And the man said, well, it's her fault. She, did, she got it and gave it to me, and, and I ate it. Right? And she says to the woman, what is it you've done? And she said, it wasn't me, it was the devil. The serpent beguiled me. Right? I mean, this is, the, this is how it's played out ever since. That's why there's so much bitterness and, and people that are filled with guilt and shame. They want to project that guilt and shame onto somebody else. And many times it's their own children. How many of you know, the, it, it, when people are not born again, there's a tendency for alcoholism to just keep on keeping on, right? There's, a, there's a, a, a tendency for child abuse and molestation and those kinds of things to carry on. Why? Because there's no separation from it. Whatever that father is saying and, and producing and presenting before that child or mother, the mother is, the kid picks it up automatically and just begins to act it out. Praise the Lord. God wants us delivered from that. And if we have an awareness of God, we don't ever have to be bound by those things again. Yes. We don't have to live, amen, in the shame of whatever our parents' problems were. They were already like God, and that was the question that the enemy came to. He said, well, you know, if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. 
They already were in the image of God. All right, John chapter 9, verse 2. Okay, who did sin? This guy or his parents? Right? Who sinned? The man or his parents that he was born blind? Now that's about the most idiotic question that I've ever heard presented. Because think about it. Did this man sin? How? He was born blind. I mean, did somehow on the way out of the birth canal? What do you he did something or no, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It, and because of that, we've got to blame the parents. It must be the parents' fault then. Somebody's got to be at fault here. Somebody has to be the, the, the issuer of this sin, right? All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And I'm, I'm just trying to s s simplify this, okay? For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those which they offered year by year, continually make the comers there unto perfect. So under the law, because man was not going to keep the law, and God knew it, he gives them animal sacrifices to protect them from the consequences of not keeping the law. But that wouldn't stop the judgment. It would just push it off. It would just keep pushing the judgment away for another year as long as they kept offering the sacrifices, right? So he's telling us that the law was just a shadow of something better that was going to come. And because it had not come, and it's not the image of it, it's not the reality of it, because those animal sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continuously, never made them perfect. Never got them really free of the problem. Just kept pushing back the consequences of it. For then would they have not. Now, if it would have done it, then they would not have ceased to be offered. They would have ceased, would not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sin. In other words, if they worked, if the animal sacrifices worked, they wouldn't have had to keep doing it because we wouldn't have even known that we had a reason to have a sacrifice. There wouldn't have been any consciousness of sin, which tells me that he's trying to get us back to that original condition where we were just innocent. Was it what we were doing or not doing? God just looked at us and said, those are my babies and they're innocent. They don't know. They're not going to be held accountable. All right? So, a true revelation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ will remove sin consciousness. And that's what I'm preaching all the time. It isn't just about grace, 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 so you can do anything you want to do. You can do anything you want to do, but there's consequences for what you do. Not judgment from God, but consequences on a natural level. Amen? Get drunk, go out and get in a car wreck. The law is going to arrest you, right? Get mad at somebody and punch them out. God's not going to get mad at you, but you'll have a lawsuit on your hands, right? I mean, so there's consequences, but they're not coming from God. Our sin now, and I've said it before, is not between me and God because God's already dealt with that. My sin now is horizontal. It's between you and me. So I can do stuff to you that is harmful that will cause consequences to me, but it isn't God judging me. It's you and me got a problem. That's why he tells us we are to love one another so that we don't have all these negative consequences. Praise the Lord. So this guy, born blind, is really trapped in a system that constantly points out your sin. That is religion. A huge percentage of Christianity is just like this guy. Trapped in a condition, trapped in a system that does nothing but say, somebody is at fault and it must be you. You got sick, you got this, you got that. Your sin has to be sin. You got to repent, you got to do right. No, if, if it's that, then what was the point of Jesus coming in the first place? It's, it is good news. It's so good that we can't hardly comprehend it. We've got to push other religious stuff in there to make it make sense to us naturally. It's so good that we have a big problem trying to understand it. We should have no sin consciousness. We shouldn't even be thinking about, oh, I hope I, I don't want to do that, or I don't want to do that. We, we, it shouldn't even be entering into our mind. We should just be living our lives, thankful to God for what he's done, and just loving each other. Amen. Just let God deal with it. Let God be God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. I'm going to 
going to have to talk faster here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, one sacrifice, he hath, look at this, perfected forever them that are sanctified. That word sanctified just means set apart. Just means one offering, perfected. I'm looking, if you're a believer, I'm looking at perfect people. That one thing alone, if we could ever grasp that or fathom that, our whole lives would be changed. Yeah. We wouldn't go to sleep with those fears and those worries, and we'd know, hey, it's all good. I'm perfect. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's the truth. Yes, that's right. But the fact that we struggle with it so much tells me that there is leaven. There's still some of that leaven. There's still some of that a little of the law spoils the whole loaf. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. I mean, I don't know about anybody else. Before I get off this planet, I'm going to be free. Yeah. I'm going to get to heaven knowing already what it, heaven's going to be like. Yeah. No guilt, no shame, no fear, no anxiety, no, no stress, no worries. The worst thing that happens is going to be the best thing that can happen. I've got nothing to fear. Franklin Roosevelt was so right. We've got nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's what the enemy works with. Fear. If he can get you into fear, he's got you out of faith. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. It's all God. It's all his work. It's all what he has done. You know, he talks about the mystery is the Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery. It's still a mystery to much of the church. For age, from ages past, this was the mystery. God wanted to be in you, yeah. not just with you. And that's the great mystery. And guess what? That was added conditionally to the Lord's Prayer. God breathed into him the breath of life. He became a living being. God put God life into him. Amen? And until he started operating by legalism, by right and wrong, by good and evil, he was fine. Him and God were in good terms. The moment he understood there was bad and there was good, it separated him from God. Now it was about him. Now it was about his behavior. God told him. It, it wasn't as much of a curse as it was just a, a, an explanation of what was coming when God said, well, now because of this, you're going to have to do everything you do by the sweat of your own brow. In other words, from now on, it's up to you. It was up to me, and I wanted to keep it that way. I wanted you to have dominion. I wanted you to be blessed and to multiply and have all the good things. But because you want to f operate from this good and evil stuff, now you're stuck with trying to have to produce it yourself. And that's what religion has done. It's about you. Yes, Jesus died for your sins. Now you've got to quit sinning. Well, how's that working for you? I mean, come on. Honestly, we can be, uh, the only way it works for you is if you're, if you're self-righteous. If you're a hypocrite. And that's what churches end up being, a, a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm not trying to be critical. I mean, I was the, the chiefest of them, just like Paul said. I mean, I was right there do, trying to figure it out. Praise the Lord. Revelation is about what it takes to produce the unveiling of the mystery. That's what this word is for. And we've made it about us. About laws for us to keep. When it's about an unveiling that he has kept it all. It's what... Not only what produces the appearing... But what the book of Revelation says withholds him or holds him back. Yeah. It's us. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're both sides of the equation. We either reveal or we hold back. We either take the throttle 
or we just back off and hit the brakes again. John 9 again, chapter, th- uh, chapter 9, excuse me, verses 3 and 4. Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. So neither one of them sinned. Their sin is not the consequence or is not the, 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 the reason for these, this blindness. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So here's what Jesus is describing in these verses. And what he's describing isn't that he's about to do a miracle. That we always dumb it down to the simplest thing. But what he's really saying is that the works that God gave him to do was the work of the cross, the work of redemption to humanity, removing sin to bring us into a new covenant with Christ. That's what he's talking about. He had not done the works yet. He'd done miracles, but it wasn't about the miracles. The work that he was mainly invested in was his death, burial, and crucifixion, or crucifixion and resurrection. And he's pointing to that. He said that this man was born blind so that you could see the works of God, and the works of God are that I'm going to be crucified, that I'm going to pay the price Amen. For whatever sin, for whatever condition a person finds themselves in, so they don't have to be blind anymore. So they don't have to suffer the consequences of human failure. Verse 6 and 7. And I'll show you how he goes on to produce that reality here. He said, when he had thus spoken, after he had said what I just said, he spit on the ground and he made clay out of his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, Adam is the clay, is the dust of the earth, right? We know that. That's God took him out of the dust and made a man, right? So the earth, the dust, represents the Adamic side of us. Amen? And he mixes it with saliva from God. Amen. The spit from Jesus. Amen. The Son of God. I mean, have you ever watched, uh, you know, one of these mystery shows, or detective shows? What do they do? When they want to get somebody's DNA, how do they find it? Take a swab. Yeah. Get some saliva. No longer are we in Adam, but in Christ. We have the best of both worlds. The visible and the invisible. The natural and the supernatural. The the, the human and the spirit. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1.10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Human and God become one. The purpose that God had from the very beginning has never changed. Okay, we'll just go a little bit further here. Song of Solomon. Chapter 5, verse 10. It's everywhere in the Bible. He just keeps saying it over and over and over. And if he that hath an ear, ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Eyes they have, but they see not. Why? Because their eyes are blinded by the law. So they're not seeing what God is really trying to reveal to us because when we see it, and believe me, I've been there, I couldn't look at it that way. I couldn't even imagine it being that way because I already had this preconceived way of looking at it which came from my denomination and and the prism through which, you know, I had been taught. And if it didn't fit that, I just didn't see it. Right? Because it wasn't preached. It wasn't taught. It it was never given us the, the idea that, hey, I could step outside of what everybody else is saying and still not have God mad at me. Because the more you think about it, when Jesus came confessing and preaching and and releasing the Word of God, these great 
Bible scholars didn't get it at all. They thought he was some kind of blasphemer and, because they were so religious minded that they could not comprehend the, the heart of God or the mind of God. Song of Solomon, Solomon says, My beloved is white and ruddy, the cheapest among 10,000. Now, if you read this, and this goes back, Suzanne gave me a, a tape series. I don't know when that was, 20 years ago maybe, something, anyway, a long time ago. And I was never, Song of Solomon wasn't something that... I learned some stuff from that because it forced me to go back and read it in a little bit different way. But here's the deal. Ecclesiastes comes before Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes, and I'll talk about it here in just a moment, Paul, Solomon is trying to figure stuff out from the natural. And it's all chaos and it's all confusing and depressing to him. But he gets a revelation and you see it unfold in Song of Solomon. It changes everything. And that's what's happening right here. We just talked about Jesus spit into this dirt and he makes some clay. He takes the DNA of God, the DNA of man, and puts them together. My beloved is white and red. That's what ready means. The cheapest among ten thousands. In other words, white represents divine or divinity. Red Represents humanity, man, Adam, right? Human and godly. Earth and heaven. Divine and human. Born from above, a new creation. God's saliva and clay. And he rubs it into the man's eyes. And what does he do? He restores his vision to what he was in the original creation. One with God. Praise the Lord. To be human doesn't mean that you're Adamic or that you're in the old creation. Because when the human emerges with the divine, the spirit of the living God comes into us and the divine connection is made. And we have access to the invisible and the visible. Heaven and earth. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous terms. So you got heaven in you, this earth vessel. Amen. Treasure in earthen vessels. We got the divine and the dust of the earth. Now, here's what I want. The day of the Lord is what we're talking about. So I, I look at this. I want you to see uh, the cry of Solomon, Where is, which is what we all have been there and maybe still are from time to time when we let that sin consciousness begin to infiltrate. So again, Ecclesiastes comes before the Song of Solomon where we get this. He gets this revelation. It's God and man, one, right? So when Solomon writes Ecclesiastes, He's looking for life under the sun. Right? I'll read a little bit of it to you in a moment just so you see I'm not just making it up. But he's looking for life under the heavens. Natural life. He's a lost soul. He's unsaved. He's looking for the essence of life. He's looking for the reason for life. He's looking for a purpose. He's looking for something that will make sense out of all of this frustration and pain and suffering and unbelief and so on and so forth. He's looking for, for life and, and what the purpose for the sons of men under heaven. What it's supposed to be. Amen. So he comes to the conclusion that it's all vanity. It's all a waste of time. All of our effort, all of our hard work, all, of the, all that we're doing in the natural is just, he says, it's vexation of the spirit or it's distressing to the spirit. Amen. And there is no life under the sun, he says. All right. Then when he writes Song of Solomon, he's not looking for life under the heavens anymore. He's found life in the heavens. Yeah. It's, everything has changed. Read the two books and you'll see they're, just, they're, they're so opposite. It's almost like the guy's schizophrenic or something, or it's two different people. But he's found something. He's come to a revelation. His life is transformed. I'll show you. Ecclesiastes uh, 1, verses 1, 1 through 10. 
What'd you turn that heat to? 350 for about 10 minutes. <laughs> That's, yeah. Just turn me over here in a minute. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Under the sun, see? One generation passes away, another generation comes, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also arises, and the sun goes down, and hasteth to his place where he rose. The wind goes toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually. The wind returneth again according to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. How many of you before you were born again thought it's nothing's going to ever, ever change? You get a little thing going for you, and then it just falls to pieces. You think it's going to turn around, and then it just goes haywire. And just when you think you got it, it escapes you. There's no new, new thing. It's just a constant, horrible cycle of failure, a little success, failure again, try to be better, then screw it up. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It's already been, it's, it has been already of old time, which was before us. Verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. I don't tell you how many times I thought that. If this could be fixed, I would have fixed it. It just doesn't seem like I can do it. The harder I try, the better to be, the worse I am, right? Mm -hmm. The desperate question of this king, living under the old covenant with no revelation, with no real understanding of what God is trying to pass on to them was, is there anything, anywhere, that you can say, it's different, it's new, it's not a repetition, it's not a repeat of the same old stuff. Discouragement. What's crooked cannot be made straight. That's why we've got people blowing their brains out. That's why we've got people ODing and drug overdoses and everything else. Why? Because what's the point? It's been horrible. Tomorrow won't be any better. I'm sick of it. Why? Because they're trying to figure it out. Life under the sun. It demands revelation. It demands a new covenant answer. Song of Solomon again, 510. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. He gets the revelation. It's God and man coming together the way he intended it to be in the first place. Not living life under the sun, but living life in the sun. Not under the heavens, but in the heavens. Heaven on earth. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.17 For those who are in Christ, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How's that for an answer, Solomon? Word to God, he could have read that it would have saved him having to write the book of Solomon or the book of Ecclesiastes for that matter. That which is crooked can be made straight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Revelation 21, 3 through 5. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Solomon, under the old covenant, was desperate for something new. We have a new life 
in a new land. Praise the Lord. We're in Graceland. And Adam has left the building. Praise the Lord. Praise God. It's good. We're, we're in a good place. Glory to God. Genesis 2 and 1. The original promise. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. That's the original promise. Heaven and earth finished. And we have them both on earth. With heaven's government. Heaven's influence. And heaven's resources. The time is at hand. John said. In other words, the throttle's in your hand. We have the ability to speed it up or to slow it down. It's a question of faith. It's a question of what you believe. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. No, 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 no. I'm saying speed it up. I've had enough idling through this life and hitting the brakes every few feet. I want the Lord's day to be revealed. I want to experience heaven's influence, heaven's resources, heaven's government here on earth. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9 and verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I know that we read that always about some future experience, but I'm telling you it can be a, a, a right here now reality as well. It can be something that we experience right now if we're looking for his appearing. Amen? That means we have control of the throttle. We decide when that appearance takes place and when it doesn't in our personal lives. There will be a general appearing. Amen? But in the meantime, I need some Lord's Day every day. I, need, I, I can't wait for another 100 years or 50 years or 30 years or, or 10 years for that matter. I need an appearing of the Lord today. Yeah. We need experiences where God, government and God's resources and, and God's influence is experienced yeah. right here and right now in this moment. And that's what healings are. That's what deliverance is. That's what, uh, you know, accepting yourself as being beloved, as being special, as being, and I don't mean that egotistically. I just mean it's a reality. It only becomes egotistical when, we, when we're measuring other people against that. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. If we're believers, we're all perfected in Christ. There's no competition here. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, uh, 10 and 11. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. If you're dead, how many of you know sin isn't going to have any influence on you? doesn't affect you. And that's what he's saying. Think of sin as though you were dead. It can't touch you. It can't affect you. It can't, it can't have any influence on you. But you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. Today, I'm looking for Christ's appearing here and now and he's appearing in you and you and you and you and you and you mm -hmm. heaven and earth is finished and all the host of them and they're in us we have one we are one with them heaven's government heaven's influence heaven's resources a finished work with ongoing effects I say, you're healed, because God said you're healed. I say you're prospered, because God says you're prospered. I say your relationships are made whole, because He said your relationships are made whole. I say you're delivered, because He sent His word and delivered us, healed us and delivered us from our destructions finished. It is finished. It's a question of will the works go on? Bind and loose. 
Change your sound, and you'll change what you see. Change your sound, and you'll change your world. Praise the Lord. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Quit believing the lies. Amen? Amen. Quit, quit believing what other people say about you and believe what God says about you. Amen. You are special to God. Amen. Amen. You, you are, He loves you. Amen. Listen to this. He loves you exactly how He loved Christ. He said it Himself. We are in the beloved. His love for you is identical to His love for Jesus. That's why He says we are seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen? He ever maketh intercession. Every time the enemy comes and says, you're a loser, you're a waste, you're a this, you're a that, He's saying, blessed. They are perfect. They are righteous. They are holy. That's all God knows about you. God knows nothing except the new you. The, the you in Christ. That's all He knows about you. It's hard to get through our natural mind, but that's the reality. God knows nothing of you except perfection. And don't let the devil or any human being tell you otherwise. Hold your head up. Praise the Lord. Remember that old song? You are somebody. You are so special that God died for you personally. Had there been no one else, Catherine, he would have died for you. Delaney, he would have died for you. In fact, he did. And what's more important, he not only died for you, you died with him. And you've been raised in newness of life. You're not the old person, amen, that the devil tries to tell you you are. You are perfect, special, righteous, holy. Amen. God pity the fool that doesn't realize how special we are. When people speak negative about you, when people talk down to you, it's because they are wrong. It's because they are foolish. It's because they do not know the truth. Yeah. The truth would set them free the same way it's supposed to set us free. Yeah. The way it sets us free is we no longer have to judge ourselves. We no longer have to condemn ourselves. We no longer have to constantly be appraising ourselves based on somebody else's behavior or somebody else's opinion. Yeah. You are who God says you are in your biggest failure, in your greatest defeat. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. And anybody that doesn't know that, it's just sad for them. Because they don't get to know the reality of who you are in Christ. I sat here this morning and listened to some of the things that were being said about me. And I'm thinking, who are they talking about? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's awkward. Because we always see ourselves with our flaws. Because we're so close to ourselves. We know every little thing. We know every little thought. We know every little failure. We know, okay, well, you did that nice thing for James, but you know you did this thing, or you did that other thing, or you did something else. So you're, we're always trying to balance the scales of our good against our evil. But God's saying, no need for scales. I've tried you and found you perfect in the balance, righteous and holy. Amen? Embrace it. Be you. I mean, that's all I'm trying to do anymore. I'm not trying to be a preacher. Amen. I'm just trying to be me. I'm just trying to, you know, and the more comfortable you get with yourself, the more fun you'll be around. I mean, for yourself. I mean, there were times I had to be drunk 24 hours a day. I had to get high all the time. Why? Because I couldn't stand being with me. Amen. I, I had to be something other than that. So if I couldn't be something else, I'd just try to kill the ability to see it or to experience it. So I just put it all away. Amen. But how many of you know you got to sober up every morning for a little bit anyway. And it's worse than it was before you got drunk the day before. Amen. The reality, it, that just sinks back in on you along with 
the guilt for the drink, being drunk the night before, right? I mean, it's just, it just, it, that's what we do as human beings. We look for ways to escape our, 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 who we are when God's telling us, embrace who you are. I've created you special. I've created you to be this unique person. Just because it doesn't fit into everybody else's little paradigm doesn't make it not real or not true. Just be you and the people that gravitate to you will gravitate to you. The others will just leave you alone. Praise the Lord. That's not bad either. You know, I love space. Outer space, but more importantly, personal space. Praise the Lord. Amen. If people don't want, to, don't want to like you, just don't let them like you. Just leave them alone. Just let them be their thing. Let them just have their problem. Doesn't change who you are. Doesn't change what God wants to do in your life and what God wants to make you. Praise the Lord. More than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Let's take a moment here. I know I'm a little bit over here, but let's, if you want to roll some that music and we'll, uh, I think I'd, I'd just like us to pray again, again for these young people and also uh, for Doak and anybody else that, that wants prayer uh, or would like to have prayer. It's just coming together. God said, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Wherever two of you agree to just touching anything, amen, I'm there. I'll do it. And we have the Word of God. So let's just use the Word of God in the way that God intended us to use it. Let's bind the devil that tries to manifest himself in all sorts of ways. But sometimes, you know, you think, well, you know, I just don't feel good about myself because, you know, other people are judging me and so on and so forth. cheerleader, you know, you're not this, and you're not that, or whatever it might be, just anything, you know, you're not the, the best athlete, you know, like when I was a kid, I tried everything, I even boxed because I just wanted to be good at something, you know, got the crap beat out of me so many times, but, you know, I tried, you know what I'm saying, I tried, but why, because I was trying to find what I am, who I am, and find some, something special about you, you know.